Welcome to Tales from the Squad Car, stories about officers and their daily interactions with the public. I'm Uncle Reddit, and have I got a story for you. Welcome back to the channel. There really wasn't enough content in the uh, Tales from Retail subreddit, so let's do something a little different. Deputy, what were the chances of that? Night Shift, 2016. A few months off, FTO on a shift as a new guy. All the senior guys don't talk to me much. I'm always assigned the worst beat and not part of the group yet. Still learning the ways of proactive policing. Partners are getting proactive guns and drugs and felony arrests weekly. All I can produce is misdemeanor warrants and suspended licenses. Release those fish back in the sea with verbal warnings. One night around 0100, I finally and clear my beat. Instead of chilling, I might try out this proactive stuff. I'm parked in a parking lot next to the driveway entrance near a main street to see what comes by. Just trying to be like my partners I looked up to. After a few minutes, a black Dodge Avenger flies by, no headlights on. My heart immediately races. I light it up right away and catch up to it. Vehicle surprisingly pulls over. Single male driver inside. He looks extremely nervous, hands are shaking. I'm still newer at this time, so I don't pick up on it. I do my seventh step and tell him he was stopped for speeding and no headlights on and question him why he was driving so fast without headlights. Driver lets out a sigh of relief and has a generic excuse for speeding and said the car was new and thought the headlights were automatic. Something seems off though. I didn't know why he looked relieved. Get his license and was about to run him for wants and warrants. As I'm about to key up, beep beep beep, dispatch tone out, something good must have happened. I turn my radio up to listen. Dispatch airs a carjacking in my beat right down the street from my traffic stop. No vehicle description. I'm awake now with a squirrel brain and immediately focus on the call. Not processing why the guy is acting strange. Think to myself, oh well, can't win them all. Toss the guy's license back inside the vehicle and tell him something on the lines of, stop driving like a dummy and I have crime to fight. Get to the scene and get victim's statement and try to relay info to my partner on area checks. Victim is scraped up. She had an argument with her ex-boyfriend. She was in the driver's seat. Ex yanked her out of the car and got in the driver's seat. Victim holds onto the car as suspect drives off through neighbor's yard and runs over a stop sign. Victim dragged pretty good distance. I ask victim a vehicle description and she tells me it was a black Dodge Avenger. My eyes widened and my heart sank. I asked her what did the suspect look like and confirms it was the guy I had pulled over a few minutes ago. I pulled over an in-progress carjacking suspect without realizing it and let him go. I've never felt more discouraged at this point. Get on radio stuttering because I'm in complete shock of what just happened and have my partners check the area, but suspect is gone. Hours later, find the car abandoned. Suspect is easily identified and I write a warrant for his arrest and he's found a week later. It was a rough learning experience, but what were the chances of that? Oh man, that's got to be so disheartening, especially when you're new. I don't know. I guess when you're new, it's a little more understandable than if you were a 20 year veteran or something. But yeah, I can see, you know, your adrenaline gets pumping when that call comes over. And like you said, squirrel brain, you get so focused on the call that you're not even thinking about the guy in front of you and why he was acting the way he was acting. And yeah, that's a shame. Well, at least they did end up catching the guy. I think your heart was in the right place. It just took a while to get that thought process ingrained in you. Deputy Priorities as a patrol officer, my priority is to answer 911 calls. My second priority is to back up my coworkers on their calls. Everything else, from stopping cars to serving warrants to jumping out on suspicious folks, is a distant third. Sometimes, though, you gotta be flexible. Squad XXX? XXX. XXX for a burglary alarm at business. MDT for further. Copy. I don't recognize the business name, so I'll need to pull over and map it. I stop and, after waiting for an oncoming car to pass, make a left turn into a darkened shopping center. I check the CAD screen for the address, plug it into Google Maps and mentally cook up a route. I then reverse back onto the road and start towards the address, coincidentally following the car that just passed me. This whole process takes perhaps 20 seconds, so I catch up to the car fairly quickly. I stop behind it at a red light. The intersection is a partial cloverleaf interchange from a freeway to a two-lane road. To our right, the entrance to the on-ramp and the exit for the off-ramp sit right next to each other. The light turns green and the vehicle in front of me turns right, but instead of the on-ramp, they enter the off-ramp. Crap. I activate my overheads, direct the spotlight at the rear of the car, and pick up the mic for my PA. 
Stop. That's the wrong way. Put your car in reverse and come back down. It's 4.30 a.m. No one else is out on the road right now. The car slows but continues up the off-ramp. I blip the siren twice, but the car keeps going. Well, I've got no choice. A wrong-way driver on the freeway is a much larger risk to the public safety than a burglar alarm. Squad XXX traffic at intersection with dark-colored Ford sedan going up the off-ramp of freeway. Stand by for plate. I got my charger up the ramp and the car stops as I get behind it. I'm dreading what I'm going to find. If this guy is DUI, I'll be here for a couple hours after my shift and I won't get any OT for my trouble. I reach the front passenger door and do my officer friendly bit. The driver is apologetic but not especially nervous. I don't smell alcohol and he doesn't slur his words or fumble for his documents. His driving was pretty good up to the point he went up the wrong ramp. I tell him to stay in the car and walk back to my squad as my partner screeches up. I call on the plate and ID number. He didn't have a license. To our wants and warrants channel before filling in my coworker on what happened. The return comes back with some good news. Squad XXX, that ID number is linked to a DL that is revoked for DUI from 1986? I'm spared the BS of dealing with DUI arrest. I click back to dispatch and hear another coworker get sent to my alarm call. Sorry, bud. I return to the car with my partner, order the driver out of the car and arrest him. He owns up to weed on his person and in the car before I search him, about 40 grams worth, which I toss because I value honesty. I have to ask though, 35 years is a long effing time to not get your license fixed. My dispatcher says your license has been revoked since you got a DUI in 1986. Why haven't you taken care of that yet? I was in prison for 24 years. I've been off the radar since I got out. Uh, what were you in prison for? Aggravated kidnapping and aggravated robbery? Jesus. When you pulled into that shopping center and then pulled back behind me, I sort of freaked out, I guess. I got a call and had to turn around. I didn't have any reason to stop you until you went up the off-ramp. Paddy Wagon takes him to jail. Tow truck takes the car to impound. The alarm that I was originally dispatched to ended up getting canceled by the alarm company before my coworker arrived. I found that while there is a lot of thinking involved and police work involved, there's also a whole lot of luck involved. Getting behind people in certain circumstances, either they give themselves away or just like the first story, you know, you pulled this guy over and he just happened to be a suspect, still giving himself away because he was speeding and had no lights on. But uh, yeah, there's definitely got to be some luck involved there somewhere. Suspect, we've got to take care of the bees. This is a story that happened to me about two years ago when Ireland suddenly went into lockdown and travel was limited to three kilometers for exercise and essential travel purposes. For those who don't know what a Garda is, they are Ireland's police force. When the initial lockdown was announced, I was extremely worried as I thought I could not go to inspect my beehives, which are in another county well outside the 3 km limit. After searching the exemptions, I was happy to discover that as a beekeeper, I was exempt from travel restrictions under the Food Production and Animal Care Clause. So off I went to my bit of land in Wicklow, and there was a guard at checkpoint, and the guard, a police officer, asked me where I was going and the purpose of my journey. I answered him that I was going up to my bit of land to inspect my beehives, and after I explained to him what I was doing, he said to me, Good man yourself, we've got to take care of the bees. Off you go. Well, that's good. He was understanding. He wasn't being a jerk. I've run into... I've had friends here locally that uh, when this all started, they uh, had checkpoints at the state lines and were trying to stop people and they really couldn't enforce that. And, you know, some people do it for work. Some people have kids they got to take care of, whatever. Yeah, it can be a real pain for officers and the public. Officer, I got tricked once. Bad. I got dispatched to the grocery store in my district once for a shoplifting report. Apparently, two teens were shoplifting and the loss prevention lady had them in custody. When I arrived, they walked me up to the loss prevention office and I see two people handcuffed. One of them was a 19-year-old girl. The other was her 14-year-old male cousin. The loss prevention lady is really nice and she and I have worked together before. She tells me, I don't know, OP. This one's a little different. So I'm confused and I ask them their names and age and immediately ask what they were doing shoplifting. The younger one says, Officer, I've been living in a car with my cousin here for almost a week, and we haven't eaten the whole time. I ask what the heck he's doing living in a car, and he says he and his cousin were living with his mom. He tells me his mom got mad because his cousin lost her job, and she kicked out the cousin. He begged for his mom to allow his cousin to stay, so his mom kicked him out right along with her. 
Now, I'm no boot, and I feel like I'm pretty good when it comes to throwing the BS flag, but this story was just too convincing, especially since the items they stole were a couple bags of chips and a couple ready sandwiches from the deli. I'm getting worried, thinking I may have a lot more work to do than a simple shoplifting report. The 19-year-old begins to cry, and she tells me, Sir, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to get my younger cousin in trouble. We were just starving. I calm her down, tell her she has nothing to worry about, and we're going to help them. First things first, we have to go to mom's house to figure out why she's kicking out her teenage son and letting him starve. I grab them both, uncuff them, pay for their food that they stole, and head to mom's house, who lives about a mile away. I get to the house, leave the two cousins in my back seat, and have my partner keep an eye on them. I knock on mom's door and she answers the door. This isn't the nicest neighborhood, but when mom answers, she seems confused as to why the police are here. She very politely asks, can I help you, sir? I get straight to the point, no beating around the bush for this guy. Ma'am, you mind telling me why you kicked your son out and let him go hungry for close to a week? She gasps and immediately changed her tone and asked, where the F is my car? Uh, excuse me? I'm asking about your starving son and niece. She says, what the hell did they do? Did they wreck my car? Oh my god, I'm so done with this girl. I tell her, hey, your son and niece were caught stealing because you kicked them out. She snaps at me. I didn't kick them out. I told them to go pick up some groceries. Oh my god, do they still have my EBT card? What? When did you send them to get groceries? Hell, I don't know, maybe two hours ago? I was shocked. Those little buggers had me fooled. Like, all the way fooled. I marched back to my car, asked the little one if he's been yanking my chain, and he hung his head a little low. Tells me he thought I was going to release them, not bring them home. The 19-year-old tells me she saw that I believed her cousin so hard. She had no choice but to go along with the story. I was furious. I stroked the 19-year-old a theft citation, gave the 14-year-old a firm lecture, gave mom a ride to the store to pick up her car, and begged my friends not to make fun of me. Thanks for reading, folks. Yep, cops are people too, man. It happens. Some people are just so convincing, you know, they turn on the waterworks and the charm and it's hard not to believe them, you know. On the flip side of that, to the general public, then you wonder why police officers tend to be very, very suspicious of any story. I've had cops walk up to me and ask me why I was speeding and 99.9% .9 of the time I just tell them, yeah, I got nothing. I was speeding and he got me. There's no excuse for it. I just was, you know. You know, there are times when, you know, nature calls in a bad way. And there was no place to really stop on the way home. And uh, they look at me like I'm stupid or like I'm trying to get one over on them when I'm really not. Still no excuse for speeding, but that's what I had. Suspect. The honeymoon incident. Shortly before the start of the pandemic, much to the surprise of my friends and family and against all odds, I got married to a very lovely woman. Since my wife speaks excellent but not quite fluent French, I suggested we take our honeymoon in France, as this meant I would have an excuse to not have to talk to anyone the entire trip. We arrived in France, picked up a little red Peugeot, and proceeded to try to eat our way across the country. We quickly realized that my wife, who learned to drive in a city notorious for its aggressive drivers, was much better at driving on unfamiliar roads than I was whose driving style could be charitably described as timid and terrified. We also quickly realized that I was much better at reading maps and navigating, so we fell into a comfortable routine where my wife would drive as I directed her from patisserie to patisserie. Did I say that right? About halfway through our trip, we were driving down a tiny countryside road. My wife insisted we were lost, while I insisted that that was impossible since I was navigating. We were just taking a very, very scenic route. It happened to loop back on itself several times. There was nothing but vineyards, cypress trees, and clear blue skies as far as the eye could see. Okay, in a couple kilometers we're going to come to the town of Try... Try... Tea something. Where we're going to take a right towards the town of... Well, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. Why did the French insist X is a silent letter again? Maybe it wasn't the best idea to have the guy who can't speak French do navigating. But we survived. A few hundred feet farther down the country road, we came around a bend to a T intersection, where an even smaller lane met the road, heading to the left. There was also a police officer standing in the middle of the road, waving us down. Behind him were two cars parked across the road with their lights on. Flares and reflector panels, the whole nine yards. The road was definitely closed. As we pulled up to the intersection, the police officer began to walk up to our car. The man was drop-dead gorgeous. Perfect Mediterranean tan, thick head of flowing black hair, 
just enough stubble to accent his perfectly chiseled jawline, with arms the size of my thighs and wearing a black shirt that your average six-year-old would struggle to fit into. He leaned into the driver's side window, pointed down the lane to the left and said verbatim, French, 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 detour, French, French, French. Oh, I thought the road ahead is closed, so they want us to take a detour down this lane, but my wife was still staring at the police officer. Her French was good, but it did sometimes take her a second to formulate what she wanted to say, so I figured it must have been more complicated than I thought, and she needed to ask a question. A couple seconds later, my wife musters all of her interlingual eloquence to reply, Huh? Wow, I think. It must be really complicated if she didn't catch it the first time. So Officer Gorgeous repeats himself, pointing down the lane more vigorously for emphasis. French, 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 detour. French, 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 French. My wife stares at him for a couple more seconds. You can see the gears turning in her head. She's obviously preparing a detailed and cogent response. Huh? My wife bats her eyes. At this point, I lean over and say, Honey, the road's closed. There's a detour. And he wants us to go that way instead. Officer Gorgeous nods emphatically and walks back to his car. My wife stares at Officer Gorgeous for a few more seconds, turns to me, shakes herself until her eyes can focus on me, and slowly turns the car down the lane. My wife is silent for the next few minutes, but finally says, But you don't speak French. How did you understand that there was a detour? Dearest, the word detour is the same in French and English. And that's the story of how my wife made goo goo eyes at a French police officer in front of me on our honeymoon. Ouch. <laughs> that's too funny. Uh, I wonder if she'd be as understanding if you made goo goo eyes at somebody and lost your ability to speak. I guess we'll never know. Well, hey guys, if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more like it, click on this video right here on the screen. I think you're going to enjoy it. See ya.